Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Today is a day that you were given that no one else has. It's strictly yours. You are a billionaire. That's enough for that. Today, my guest is Judy Miller. Judy Miller started her career as a certified public accountant and went on to excel in the world of corporate finance. Most of her life has been dedicated to personal development and helping others excel in a constantly changing environment. Judy has trained with some of the world's most spiritual visionaries as an author, coach, speaker. She will inspire you to live a more passionate and filled a life with great, filled with greater clarity, joy, and happiness. What's up, Miss Judy? Well, it's great to be here, Emmett. I thought you were going to break out in song for us. You know, I'm surprised I actually hit that note because lately uh, I've been a little flat. Mm. <laughs> you know, usually I'm, it is. Well, you have an amazing voice. Why? Thank you so much. So tell us about what got you to now. Give us your backstory because everyone has a backstory. We don't just plop into this dimension as we are in now, full and intact. It's usually a journey. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Emmett, have you ever felt different like you didn't belong? <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe you felt incomplete, always searching for someone or maybe something to make you feel whole. No, I found that. That's great. Have you ever felt unworthy, always having to prove yourself over and over again? Once again, let's go back to the first statement. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emmett, the reason I ask you these questions is because these feelings have literally plagued me for most of my life. I was actually born in Trinidad, which is an island in the Caribbean, and I moved to the U.S. when I was very young. But, Emmett, I never looked like anybody in my neighborhood. I always felt different. I was also born with 11 fingers and I had this unexplainable terror of the night. Did you say 11? 11. How does that work out? Oh, I bet you're great at math though. <laughs> well, that's, be, what, that's where I'm the CPA comes from. That would be awesome. <laughs> as a kid? <laughs> yeah, you know, but as a kid, I felt different. Yeah, I, I felt like I didn't belong. I always felt that I was unworthy. So in the introduction, you mentioned that I started my career as a CPA. I then went into finance to work in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. But for my entire life, not, not my entire life, most of my life, I felt like I had no value, that I always had to prove myself. But on this journey that I describe in my book, what I realized is that when we let go of the stories, the labels, and the judgments, we could be anything that we want. Oh, yeah. We could emerge as our true and authentic self. Um, so that's why I describe in my book, Perfect. So, you know, the, the subtitle to the book is called A Path to Love, Forgiveness, and Transformation. But there's so many different definitions of forgiveness. But for me, forgiveness is really simple. It means to forgo or to, to let go of. So painful and unwanted events are going to happen to all of us. Yeah. We could either experience it once or we could literally play it over and over again, hundreds, maybe even thousands of times until it becomes stuck, until it becomes our identity. So for me, forgiveness is really simple. It's really just to let go of those contracted negative stories that no longer serve us so we could move forward and truly experience true freedom and happiness. You know, I was having this discussion last night. I was talking about generations and I, I was thinking about uh, my parents. My parents came up from the South uh, in the 60s, I think my dad was already here, but my mom came from the South. And my mom used to tell me these stories that I thought were just absolutely wild. My mom told me stories about, I was like, what'd you do for summer vacation? She's like, I picked cotton. I'm like, what? She was like, yeah, we got up at like 4.30 in the morning, we picked cotton till like noon, and then we went about the rest of our day. I was like, I'd be done. So, you know, I, I know as the generations go by, our lives have gotten easier, but if you're in that moment, all you see is the hardship. All you see is the things that are, and if you compare it to others, or if you compare it to other experiences, 
it can seem very trivial, but to yourself, it can seem like it is blown up. In your life, did your family background have any bearing on how you felt? Yes, and absolutely. So can I share an overall summary of the story perfect? You and can, I can do share, you. <laughs> and, then I can, and then you can see how my family background absolutely played into who I am today. Okay. So, so as a child, I had fears as a child. I was actually afraid of drowning. But I was also, as I mentioned before, terrified of the night. And I was also afraid of being assaulted. And I had never been assaulted. So this fear as a child was very, very confusing. So I was actually terrified of going to sleep every night. Wow. So every night as a child, I would literally crawl into bed, close my eyes, pull the covers over my head, and I would recite the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again until I would eventually fall asleep exhausted. Now, Emmett, this was my ritual night after night. This continued well into my 20s. We talked about me starting my career as a CPA. So here I am having a very traditional job, very traditional lifestyle, going to work during the day, and then at night, terrified of what I couldn't explain. As an adult? As an adult. So then I met my husband at work. We got married. We had kids. We had two children. And in the exhaustion of raising two incredible kids, commuting three hours a day to work, working 40 to 50 hours a week, in that exhaustion, Emmett, everything stopped. The you terror. Tired to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet, I think so. The terror, the pain, everything stopped. The energy stopped. But then my kids grew up and they went off to college okay. and the house became silent. And many empty nesters may know what that feels like, but the house became silent. And in that silence, everything returned. The terror, the pain, the fear, everything returned. I would literally, I must have looked comical because literally I would tiptoe around my house afraid of what or who I might bump into. I would wake up in the middle of the night, terrorized, clutching at my husband in fear. And we both began to lose sleep. Around the same time, I actually started to bleed uncontrollably month after month, and I went to see my doctor, and she said that I needed a hysterectomy. And as you mentioned, I worked in the healthcare industry for over 20 years, so I trust modern medicine, but I was terrified of this surgery. It felt, Emmett, like the same terror that I had as a child and the same terror that returned to me as an adult. So a good friend of mine recommended that I read a book called Light Emerging, it's by Barbara Brennan, and Barbara was actually a former NASA physicist, and she studied the human energy field, and what she learned, she was actually able to heal people. So here I am, literally days before my surgery, and I'm Googling on the internet, healers near me, and as I sat across from my healer for that very, very first time, I literally heard the click of a lock, like my entire life was finally locking into place. But Emmett, at the time, I didn't know the role that that healer would actually play in my family's history. So my healer helped me heal after the hysterectomy. And in the following months, we continued to work together. We continued okay. to look at where these unexplainable fears were coming from. So we looked at my childhood to see if anything had actually elicited it, but nothing came to mind. And then we started to talk about my parents, your question. We started to talk about my parents because we know we inherit so many things from our parents. From our DNA, we inherit the color of our hair, the color of our eyes, the shape of our nose, and so many other physical characteristics. But the science of epigenetics says we could actually also inherit the pain and the terror from our parents. Yeah. And it's shaking his head. So they've actually shown with Holocaust survivors that their children and their grandchildren actually have in their bodies the same pain and terror that their parents went through or their grandparents. Yep. And you're about to say something. Yeah. Well, I, I fully understand this because, you know, as a man of color, as a, as a black man in America, people say, just get over it. And you don't realize on an energy level, this stuff is transmitted. So let's see, uh, it, it's 2000. Let's see. Slavery ended in, um, the 1880s, which my great grandmother was coming out of that, uh, that stuff still has a resonance in the community for so many people. And people are just like, oh, why don't you just get over it? Pain is pain, and pain is an energy that can carry forward. It does, it just transmits. I mean, not transmit, but it just kind of slightly changes form. And people carry that with them. And you find people who are 
they're going through some things and no one can explain it, but sometimes you have to go out of the dimension that we know, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, up, down, left, right, um, and time. You have to go past that. You have to go down to this level where the energy is, is premium, which we call the atom. Mm, And you're absolutely right. You know, there's been recent studies that have been done with actually mice. They introduced the scent of cherry blossoms to mice, and then they will zap them on the feet. So Emmett, as you can imagine, they would get rid of the zapping, but just the smell of cherry blossom would trigger that same fear. But what's amazing is that the mice's children and their grandchildren, just the scent of cherry blossoms, would trigger that same fear and terror in in these mice. They had never been exposed to the father that was zapped, and they've never been zapped. Um, so that fear and that terror that I actually felt every night wasn't actually my own. It was actually a cellular memory from my mother. I discovered recently when I was, you know, on this journey that my mother was actually attacked as a child. And this was a cellular memory from her. So Emmett, it goes even further. They say every female baby is born with two to three million of their reproductive eggs at birth. Yeah. So as your mother goes through the triumphs and the trials of her life, you were actually in her body as an unborn egg. So on a cellular memory perspective, you actually experienced a lot of the pain and the trauma that your mother went through. Yeah. So in my case, it was the cellular memory from my mother, Van Emmen. My story doesn't end there. And you said before, you know, we go out of this dimension, up, down, sideways. There's actually a shocking past life connection to the very healer I trusted in this lifetime to heal me. She was actually the one that caused the pain and the terror on my family. And Emmett, Emmett, Emmett. It's like Netflix. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's like Netflix. But Emmett, in that moment of revelation, I could have felt fear, anger, betrayal, but I didn't. All I felt was the love and the perfection of the universe because I saw how all of our souls are actually interconnected across lifetimes, how we're unconditionally loved by the creator and how we can heal in this lifetime or in any other lifetime. I, so I know I, <laughs> I understand that I do yeah. mm-hmm. because I've also, it's been explained to me Sometimes your enemies in life, those people who cause you hardship, that is a cosmic contract for you to learn something. Mm -hmm. Like this person, like like you're up in the ether and you're like, you know, I'm going to give you this lesson. It's not going to be comfortable. You're like, yeah, 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 bring it. Then you're like, who is this person? And why do they keep (laughs) falling back into my, my gravity? But it's a lesson that you need to learn. And what happens is once you really hone in on the lesson, they go away. Yeah, absolutely. Have you read Have you read uh, Little Soul in the Sun? No. It's a children's book, so I'm not surprised you haven't read it. But it's by Neil Donald Walsh, and basically says, in heaven, everything is perfect. So we cannot truly experience our perfection because everything's perfect. Yeah. So we agree to come to Earth to learn our lessons. But when we come to Earth, we forget. So in this story, the little soul in the sun, um, this little soul wants to learn about forgiveness. And God says, well, there's nothing to forgive. Everything's perfect. And um, this angel of light comes forward and says, I will help you. I will do something so atrocious that you will have to learn to forgive and you will have to learn unconditional love. And he goes, well, why would you do that? And she goes, well, I'll do that because I love you. But in the moment that I strike you, Please remind me because I'll be pretending so hard to be what I'm not, I would have forgotten. And then they come to earth to learn out their lessons. So so very similar to what you were saying about our contracts when we come to earth. See, there's a movie that I like. There's a movie that always kind of brings me to a tear. It's called Made in Heaven. I think it's an 80s movie. And it's about a couple who meet in heaven. They fall in love in heaven and then they're born. You know, you forget. And mm-hmm. then their journey to click back up and through the whole movie, they keep missing each other. Go see it. It, it. it kind of resonates on a very positive level though, of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. But how did, so once you went through that and, and you experienced this love and you experienced uh, this new knowing, because this is probably something that was foreign to your consciousness before and it's, it's developing as you're going through it. How did that shift you into perfect? 
Well, exactly. you've been an author. It's, it's exactly. It's a journey, right? So many people ask me if I knew about the relationship that my healer had with my family in the very beginning, would I have had the same experience? And I would probably be telling a very, very different story because it took the universe a year to help me get ready to understand this. So before when I was telling and sharing the story with you, I said in that moment of revelation, I could have felt fear, anger, or betrayal. I could have created a story that would have haunted me for the rest of my life, but I didn't. I chose to see the miracle in it instead. So what Perfect does, it shares my journey with people, but it also teaches them to let go of the stories that no longer serve them. Because so many of us have created these stories about our lives that aren't necessarily true. Some of us like the pain mm -hmm. because it's familiar. Yeah. And you see people who develop into something, right? They develop into this new character and everything is going well, but yet they'll jump back into this barrel that was a travesty to them, that caused them pain, that caused them hardship. What, in your opinion, where does that come from? So I agree with you. We get so stuck in our stories, it becomes our identity. And it becomes hard to let go of because even if it's painful, it's familiar. Yep. Sometimes people fear is just because people aren't comfortable with the unknown. So I have an acronym. I call it NEST. And it's what I use to help me get past those stories. So can I share it with you? Of course. <laughs> so the N stands for notice, to truly notice our thoughts and our stories. So Emmett, we have 60,000 thoughts a day. 95% of them are the same ones we had yesterday and the day before, and 80% of them are negative. As humans, we're actually hardwired to notice the negative aspects of a situation because millions of years ago when we were cavemen and cave women, it was critical for our survival, right? But we no longer live in that reality. So we need to retrain our minds to not focus on the negative, but to focus on gratitude and to focus on love. So that's the N. The E stands for truly to experience our emotions in our bodies, right? So many of us are actually not trained to feel our emotions. H have you ever heard boys don't cry? I mean, I've heard big girls don't cry. So many of us are actually not taught to truly feel our emotions. We either stuff it away, we deny it, or we think about it. And when we think about it, we're actually not feeling it. So Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor was a Harvard neuroscientist. She wrote the book called um, My Stroke of Insight. She was actually able to heal herself from traumatic brain injury. But what I got out of her book was the 90-second rule. And that when an event happens, either good or bad, it literally takes us only 90 seconds to actually experience that event in our body, through our physiology, and then let it go. After those 90 seconds, it's up to us. Do we let it go or do we create a story? And if we create a story, is it an empowering story or is it a disempowering story? So for me, emotions are meant to be felt in the body, not thought of. So I believe the body tells the truth. Our mind is not always accurate. I want to I wanna discuss that with you now because okay. we're, we're in an age where individuals, especially um, Gen Z, are saying or are being taught that their feelings are the point of reason. So mm -hmm. you get your truth from your feelings versus something that's not connected to your feelings at all. So I'll put it like this. You can be assaulted now on the feeling level. It, and it is equated to if I physically assault you. And so what you were saying is like, you, you really should pay attention to your feelings, but how do you compartmentalize that? Because our feelings can also take us away from what truth is because mm -hmm. it's our interpretation of what we're feeling. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's a great point. So emotions, people put a labels on our emotions, fear, hate, love, right? They're putting labels on the emotions and the labels are a story. So when I talk about truly feeling, it's to feel those sensations in our bodies without actually creating a label. So, uh. so for example, when, when people used to say negative, hurtful things to me growing up, I used to feel it in my chest. It felt like an elephant sitting on my chest and I couldn't breathe, right? So 
What I do now is whenever I'm triggered by that, I truly feel that emotion. I don't label it. I don't label it as hate or fear. I just truly feel the emotion. And you can do this with me if you want to. So, you know, I literally put my hand on wherever I feel that emotion. I acknowledge it. I breathe into it. And then as I breathe into it gently, I could feel that emotion or that sensation. I use emotion because people are more yeah. you know, associated with that word. But that sensation starts to dissipate. It starts to soften. So Emmett, whenever I have a contraction in my body now, I don't try to label it. I say, thank you. Thank you for this blessing. And the reason is, is because my body is telling me that I'm holding a contraction, a story, a trauma that needs to be healed. And I know that, you know, listening to your podcast, I know that you talk about current events, right? Yeah. I believe that the earth is contracting, our fires, our hurricanes, our riots, our COVID-19. It's the earth contracting, telling us the same thing on a global level, that it's time to heal our relationships with each other, and it's time to heal the planet. So we need to feel our sensations without labeling it. I agree with you. I hear a big butt. <laughs> I, I agree with you because in, in certain aspects, when I take a step back from my humanity and I traverse, I do a Superman. You know, Superman can go into space and he can just kind of hang out in space and listen to the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And if I, if I was objective about it, I would say we're a virus here. I mean, we could be very viral on this planet where we just, where viruses just consume without any regard to anything around it. I mean, they will consume to their detriment, ultimately killing the host. And mm -hmm. it seems like that's what we're doing. Now, I've said this to a friend of mine yesterday because I'm trying to get her on the show. I said, we have traversed through two periods of masculine ages, which is um, the ram and the fish, which is I forgot what the ram is, and Pisces. And we are traversing into this area from the song that I heard back in the 60s, the age of Aquarius, which is a very feminine age, which is actually what I'm seeing manifest. I'm seeing a very kinder, gentler society that is trying to communicate and be open with their inner spirit. Mm -hmm. But it's not going easy. <laughs> As we can see, and I understand what you're saying, is we really need to look at w what has happened. We live in the most comfortable time ever recorded. Mm -hmm. The most comfortable. I look at my kids, we don't, they don't have to, they really don't have any fear, but they have fear. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is sit back and, like you said, take a deep breath. Yeah what's right mm -hmm. you know what i said yeah i didn't say the opposite i said okay what's right i'm here i'm safe i'm healthy i just had a ham sandwich <laughs> 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 you know what i'm saying and a lot of people are missing that and it seems like you tapped into okay what's going on to me physically uh what non-physical thing has threatened my physicality and what does it mean? Which is what most people don't do. Mm -hmm. So that, that's awesome. Now with this, how can people find out if, if they're not really grasping it, how can they find Judy and like, Judy, I, I, I kind of get what you're talking about, but I'd like to find out more. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so can I just comment on what you said before? And yeah. then I would definitely like to share more. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a friend who said, you know, I really wish that we could go back to the way things were before. Right. <laughs> right. 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 No cell phones. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Given everything that's going on in our current environment and our current society. But one of the things that I tried to tell her was that in the contrast, there's the clarity. So if we didn't have this contraction happening in the world today, we would not, it, would not be at our, it would not be at the forefront of our awareness to heal, right? So sometimes we need that contrast so we can get clear on what we really need to do. Yeah, because I see some really obtuse, uh, 
how do I want to say this? I see the world is really obtuse at this moment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like two sides of the coin, the yin and the yang. One side is just so obtuse. And then there's this other side that's like, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But it's also shedding a light on us, really focusing in on some of the, particularly in the United States, I'm not that versed in what is happening in other countries, but I think very similar stuff is happening where people are saying, uh, this thing has happened. And I'm, I, I'll just use our presidential election. Like this thing has happened, but, and we thought it was going to be great. And a lot of it is based in old mentality, but there's a new mentality that's saying, no, we don't want that. We want to go in this direction and you guys keeping this thing afloat is preventing us from moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I get it. <laughs> so, so Emma, just to finish what we were talking about before. So nest really notice and observe your thoughts. Yes. You, you, you got to replace it with more positive, you know, more positive, empowering thoughts. E, truly experience your emotion. S, scratch the record. So I learned this from Tony Robbins. We keep playing the same stories over and over and over again. We need to scratch the record so we can't play the same song over and over again. So when you ever, when you start to notice you have a negative thought, scratch the record. Say cancel, cancel, cancel Claire. Replace it with a more empowering story or do something zany or crazy to get out of that cycle. And then T, I know that we're limited on time, but the T. No, we oh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> And then T stands for tender, loving care. Right now, I know so many people feel isolated, and not just with COVID-19, but so many of us in society feel lonely and isolated. And I believe the isolation is not because we're isolated from each other. It's because we've become disconnected from the creator, and we've become disconnected from ourselves. So many of us have abandoned ourselves emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So now is an opportunity to reconnect with ourselves because when we spend time reconnecting with ourselves, we remember who we are. We remember the essence of who we are, which is love itself. So when you say we're disconnected from our creator, do you think that the organization of religion has pushed us to disconnect? I think, you know, I believe that we are very powerful beings and that everything that happens in my life, I've created. Okay. So I tend not to say it's religion or education, et cetera. It's so it's an individual I, thing. I do believe, you know, but we are influenced from our environment, but it's what I do with it. Yeah. So I can just share another story with you that brings it to light. So I said, I felt different most of my life, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, I attracted a man into my life that was totally different, religiously, racially, culturally, socially. And I never felt like I belonged in his family. I literally closed my heart because I was afraid they would judge me and they were afraid that they wouldn't love me. So much of my story that I describe in Perfect, it actually almost sounds like a near-death experience. Many of the spiritual experiences sound like a near-death experience. Yeah. So in this particular situation, my mother-in-law just passed away. And she came to visit me and I was literally communicating with her and she showed me every scene that I had with my husband and his family. It went by in seconds. You know, when people die, they have these near death experience. They say they see their whole life in review literally in seconds. And this is exactly what it was. But what she showed me and what she taught me was because I felt different because I had the energy of being different. That's the reality I created. So what's happening on the outside is a reflection of what's happening on the inside, right? So we have, you're about to ask. No, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm, <laughs> I'm emotionally reacting to it. it it's, it's just made a smile on my face because I think so many people can identify with that. Yeah, so I realized, you know, I made myself different and that was the experience that I had. So when you were growing up, were your parents born in Trinidad? Yes, they were. So what was so different about their lives? It, so if you can like extract their lives into yours, like your, your mom and your, and your dad, how did that, how come it didn't calm the fear? You know, I, do you understand why like your mom didn't see like, why is she, you know, I had this experience 
when I was a kid, maybe she's going through it, or was it just a different time? Well, number one, I never shared the fear of being assaulted because even as a child, I knew it was unusual and different. Yeah. So I actually only shared that as part of my book coming out. So I never told my mother that I felt like I was going to be attacked at night. Ah, you just couldn't sleep. You just thought you were insomniac. Or yeah, or I was like other children who, you know, was afraid of monsters under the bed or monsters in the closet, okay. not realizing the true terror that I felt every night. So, you know, even though my parents were from Trinidad and I was born in Trinidad, when I moved to the U.S., and this, this book is not about race or discrimination at all, it's about love, um, I didn't look like other people. I just didn't fit in. And, you Where know, did you move to the, in the U.S.? So I moved to California first. And again, this was many, many years ago. Um, so I know that it's different now. <laughs> but when I was growing up, there was no one else that looked like me. <laughs> Where were you in California? SoCal or Nor NorCal? Or I was in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Oh, I could see. Okay, I could yeah. see. So, so, so Trinidadians don't consider me Trinidadian. Chinese people don't consider me Chinese. Indians don't consider me Indian. So I'm mixed. Yeah. Um, Trinidad is known as the, the kind of the rainbow nation. Yeah. So I never belonged anywhere. But, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, when I, I felt like I was nothing. But Emmett, in the nothingness, this is the secret. In the nothingness, we could be anything. When there's no stories, no labels or judgments, we could be anything we want. And that is true. So when you were, and I, can, I actually can picture this. So probably when you were younger, particularly when you moved to the United States, you probably got a lot of this statement. What are you? Mm -hmm. Because my own family is very ethnically diverse. <laughs> and, you know, in having conversations with my children, they get to share experiences with me that I just couldn't have fathom, you know, having because my neighborhood I grew up in was very homogeneous till my mom moved me out to the suburbs. And then I started to understand what you are talking about, where I'm like, whoa, I thought I was in the majority. And then I really figured out that in this country, let me make that clear, I'm in the minority. Now I'm starting to understand at the age of 14, when I'm starting to you know, become an adult, uh, heading toward an adult. So a lot of the things that you're talking about, I can reminisce and identify with. And for me, I just had to say, you know, I'm a powerful creature. I can do anything I want, especially when you attach the positive energy with, and for lack of a better word, as you said, with the emotion, I attracted my wife because they ask for her with a high level of emotion attached to it. All the things that I've, I've, I've literally gone through some situations where I attach this high level of emotion with my, my energy center in the form of a prayer. And it came to fruition. When I don't attach the emotion to it, it just kind of flutters by. I'm like, why didn't that thing happen? Because I didn't attach the emotion to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, I discovered this quite by accident. You know, I used to go to my healers once a week. And as I would lay on the healing table for 15 to 45 minutes, I had nothing to do. So I would literally just close my eyes. And I would picture people and places and things that I loved. And I would lay there and I would not only just see it, I actually don't really visualize like other people because I don't see it when I close my eyes, but I would picture my husband or my children or my dog. And I would literally feel every single emotion that was going through me at the time, right? And I would feel it, taste it, touch it. And then I would bring in another scene, because again, I was there for 45 minutes, of yeah. something that I loved. It could be the first sunset, the first snowfall. It could be the first time I held my children. And I would feel and experience all of that. And then I would bring in another motion. So Emmett, my heart was opening. I was vibrating on a very, very high level. When my mentor, Dr. Sue Mortar says, put your hand on your heart and multiply those sensations 10 times more and say to yourself, this is me. The sensation of love is mine. It is me. 
And we can create that same sensation of love in any moment. It's not dependent on anyone or anything. And I believe by doing that, you know, on an ongoing basis, your heart begins to open. You begin to live life truly from a place of love. And when we live our lives from a place of love, Emmett, there's no separation. So have you ever had your heart broken? Absolutely. It's one of the first, it's one of the first stories I included in my book, Perfect. So I'm, and I have a purpose for asking this question. Mm -hmm. Where did you feel it? Did you feel it in your heart or did you feel it in your solar plexus? In my heart. So this was, uh, this was in college and uh, um, my boyfriend was Irish and he took me home to meet his parents. I was friends with his sisters and she was about to get married. And his parents were so upset that I was a different nationality. And again, my book is not about discrimination whatsoever. Um, and his father told him that if I came to the wedding that uh, he wouldn't walk his sister down the aisle. Oh. So shortly thereafter, um, his father gave him an ultimatum. You either break up or you move out. So he broke up with me and I truly felt that my heart was broken. But Emmett, you know, these events happen, painful events happen in our lives, but the most dangerous part is not the event. The most dangerous part is the stories that we create about the event and that we get stuck in. Or holding on, Be exactly. you know, and that, that's a real thing because you remember when you were a teenager, mm -hmm. I, a school year took forever, forever. <laughs> As you become an adult, Years literally fly by. You're like, where did that, what are the, that was seven weeks ago? I did that seven weeks ago. What happened? So a lot of times what happens is something occurs and we hold on to it. We stay in that moment. We relive in that moment. And like you're saying, you have to acknowledge it 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. After at 91, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. 92. If you can let it go and you can move on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, Stephen Covey wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People in the late 80s. And he said, between stimulus and response is our greatest power, the power to choose, the freedom to choose. So for me, how I've applied that in my life is between stimulus and response, there's a gap. And in that gap, I get to decide. I get to decide how I react. And for me, there's really only two emotions. Everything falls into either fear or to love. And fear for me is just a negative contracted story. Me thinking about the past, wishing I could change it, or me worried about the future, right? So when I let go of the fear, there's only love that's left. So I have a choice and how I want my life to unfold. All right, so uh, can you do me a favor and go through the chapters of your book chapters of my book okay like the, the chapter tap 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 I'll, I'll you know you I'll, i was listening to your podcast and you said we are spiritual beings right yes okay so i'm going to give you i've already shared with you one i'm going to give you three other That's parts fair. in the book That's fair. So, so the first one is i was sitting in church on good friday waiting for mass to start and i'm just listening to the choir and my kids are probably texting on their phones and I'm just sitting there, nothing happening. And then all of a sudden, this overwhelming sense of love literally descends on me. And like I said, many of the experiences that I had in this book are like near death experiences. It was like dying with my eyes wide open, Emmett. So this feeling of love literally descended upon me and it was every single description of love you could imagine multiplied a mul millions, millions of times. And it just overflowed from my body and started to come out as tears. And the reason I share that story is because as I mentioned, I felt different, unworthy, incomplete. But if we knew how much we were loved, we would live our life very differently. Yeah. Right. So that was the first experience, realizing that we are incredibly loved and accepted. The second experience, which I describe in my book, you know, you're talking about the chapters, was as I was laying in bed recuperating from my hysterectomy, I refused to take painkillers just because of so many, you know, sad stories about people getting addicted. So I refused to take painkillers and I laid in bed because every movement, every sneeze, every sudden oh. movement, and felt like an electric shock literally going through my abdomen. But as I was laying there, this Irish guy would gently float in and out of my awareness. And what she said to me was, we are never alone, never abandoned, always loved. If you knew who stood beside you in every moment, 
you would never be afraid. And if we knew who stood beside us in every moment, we would live our lives differently. So it's these events that started to change how I view and how I see the world. So that's, that's one chapter. <laughs> that's another chapter. And because then the- break it up Because, and the reason I say this is because you break it into parts. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. part one, you have part two. Mm-hmm. And within those parts, uh, there's like four or five chapters per part. Absolutely. That you have going in. Right, so I wrote it like that on purpose. So most people don't read past the first 19 pages of the book. So 80 to 90% of perfect is actually written like a novel. So you want to know how it ends because there is a shocking ending that you want to get to. And then there's a handful of pages that I call reflections because I want people to see and also learn about what are the lessons that they could apply in their own lives. So that's the second part of it. And then the last part is these very, very simple exercises that I've incorporated into the book to allow people to to embody the lessons in their own life. And Emmett, I made them purposely simple because I know how busy and crazy everybody's lives already are. Awesome. So the book is... I'm Perfect. Gonna, yeah. The but there's more called, to it. <laughs> the book is called Perfect. That's what I was... <laughs> <laughs> so it's behind me. The book is called Perfect, A Path to Love, Forgiveness, and Transformation. I was, I was looking right at it. I was going through chapters. <laughs> so in 2020, 2021, I hate dating things, but I just did it. So moving forward, what, how can people reach you? How can people find out more? Are you doing like live streams? Are you, do you have YouTube channel, Facebook groups, TikTok? So the best way to find me is Judy with an I, J-U-D-I Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R dot net. All my social media handles are there. I have a monthly blog. I have a free ebook that I give to people, no charge whatsoever, called Awaken the Creator Within. Also, with the purchase of Perfect, there are five free bonuses. So I recommend that if you buy the book, definitely go to my website. And it's five free bonuses from my favorite transformational teachers. Um, Marcy Shimoff, Deborah Poneman, um, Janet Atwood, Dr. Sue Mortar. Um, so there are great five bonuses on how to really live a life full of love, joy, and happiness. Um, so that's the gift when you buy the book. When's the audio book coming out? The audio book is coming out. Um, that's something that I'm working on. My, you my got main the voice for it, man. You got the perfect <laughs> voice for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my main focus is really just to get the book out and then to share the story. So. The book just came out two months ago, so. That's all right. Hey. Yeah. You got to, what else are you going to do? It's COVID. <laughs> all right. So, you know, I, I really want to thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. It has been an absolute honor to have this conversation with you, with someone who is kind of in tune with my thought process. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Emmett. So, this is how we conclude the podcast. Remember, you are a billionaire. And I have this conversation every show. And I have it with so many people who ask, what is your show about? And I say, it's about you. Because you're a billionaire. They're like, I don't have a billion dollars. I'm like, shut your mouth. It's not about money. It's about you. Because... What happened was two people got together in the traditional sense and he gave something to her. And this is what happens. This is why I love the feminine because if you give them things, they make things. So two became four, four became eight, eight became 16 for 30 days. We're just gonna go 30 days. At the 30 day mark, you were over a billion cells. You hadn't even hit the planet. If you want to take it to the right now, just take a look at your hand. Yeah, I got big hands. Just from the tip of your finger to where your hand meets your wrist, that is your hand. You flip it back and forth. It is made of these things called cells, which constitute the self. Get it? In that area, there is a multiverse of stuff, and there are at least a billion cells there, and they're yours. So when you start to think about it, you are a billionaire born 
to this planet because you're a spiritual being having a physical experience. When you feel down, I want you to do this. Act like a naturist. When you get out the shower, drop your robe, walk over to the mirror and revel in all those molds, those folds, those jiggly parts or whatever you have because we have yet to be able to actually make something like you. You are like the stars in the sky. Your value is immeasurable. Till next time, love you all. Peace.